produced in association with KPMG Australia, this is What Happens Next with Whitney Fitzsimmons. Hello, I'm Whitney Fitzsimmons. Coming up on the program, space, the new frontier. We find out what it's like to rocket through the atmosphere seeing the earth down there where all of humanity has lived forever and um, every single person right down below me it was kind of a very humbling experience. We get a look at Australia's growing space industry. We are quite heavily dominated by startup and scale-up companies uh, who are doing a range of things. And we catch up with the founder of one of Australia's leading space companies. I've always been interested in space and I thought well I want to do what I love What I love looks like it's going to take off, so, you know, I'm going to have a go. That's all coming up when we discover what happens next. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, command engine start, 2, 1. For many of us, the thought of space travel is the stuff of fantasy or science fiction. with the second human space flight crew. What a launch, we are on our way to space. But for my next guest, that dream became a reality. For New Shepard's second human flight with Audrey Powers, William Shatner, our customers, Glenn DeVries and Chris Bosshausen on board. They are To well find out what it's really space. like traveling so through far, space, I spoke to former NASA engineer and Blue Origin astronaut, Chris Bosshausen. New Shepard giving them a beautiful flight to space this morning. Chris Bosshausen, welcome to the program. Hi, Whitney. Thanks for having me. So, Chris, you were one of the four people that was uh, flying on Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket. What was it like looking down on Earth? Oh, that's just so amazing. Um, you know, seeing seeing the Earth down there, uh, you know, where all all of humanity has has lived forever, and mm. um, every single person right down below me, it was kind of a very humbling experience. Weightlessness. Oh Jesus. <laughs> This is oh. I was always worried as a space person, I've been in the space industry my whole life, that I'd be a little desensitized when I went up there. I can't believe you. But I, I'm, I'm happy to report that it was more dazzling and almost more shocking than I could have ever expected. So yeah, it was very, very cool. No description can equal this. You had William Shatner sitting near you. Did you get him to say space, the final frontier, as you were flying up into space? <laughs> Uh, he, he he has a good comedic t- sense of comedic timing, so he, he, he made his own jokes uh, when they were necessary. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. And uh, what was it like with the other people? Like, what were their reactions like when you guys were rocketing through space? Yeah, so we were a crew of four, um, and with me was Glenn DeVries, um, who's an entrepreneur and longtime space geek, and um, and then Audrey Powers, who's a senior leader at Blue Origin. So she was kind of like an insider, kind of kicking the tires for the team, I think. And yeah, I mean, they, they were an amazing crew, and, um, you know, just seeing their reactions. Um, you know, I'm a little bit of an engineer, so it takes me a little bit of time to process things, but just seeing particularly Glenn, uh, how he's so radiant and, uh, and his, his just joyful presence was, was amazing on the flight. Mm. Were you scared at all though? Because, you know, this is quite a, um, it's a big challenge and it is risky. Were you scared? Yeah, so I've in my career I've launched probably about fifty-five rockets, I think, um, mm-hmm. in various capacities, and of those, five of those have failed to reach orbit, now, or in other words, blown up. Um, mm. And so that, that's a one in ten odds. So here I am strapping myself to a giant tank of hydrogen and hoping everything goes well. So, yeah, I was nervous, very, very nervous. Um, and I remember the morning of the of the flight; it almost felt like I was walking the plank. Um, in Pirates of the Caribbean or something as I was walking down to the launch site. <laughs> um, so there was yeah. definitely a sense of, of the, um, you know, the, the risk and, and what was at stake there. And 
I imagine that each of you on board would have had to have been charged with some sort of responsibility or task to take care of. Is that is that right? No, actually, our, we had one primary job, which was to look out of the window. Oh, it was a joyride. Well, in a sense. So Audrey, um, being a Blue Origin team member, she had had some some functions to perform, um, some, mm-hmm. some experiments to run for her team. They wanted to try out a few things, so she did that. But for us... Um, you know, we were, you know, part of this first wave of people, you know, regular citizens heading out into space. And I felt that, you know, the job that I assigned myself was to come back and be an ambassador for why I think this is important and why the human race should go to space. So that was sort of my job and the mission. Was it comfortable going up in this rocket? Yeah, no, it was wonderful. Um, You know, the seats are very comfortable. They're designed so that you can, you know, have a little bump on the ground and still feel pretty comfortable. Um, mm-hmm. So the seat is great. You're pretty much laying down. Um, like in a dentist chair. Mm -hmm. The ride is actually very smooth. I I think I could probably hold a cup of coffee in my hand on the way up and it would not spill a drop. Yeah, it was that smooth. It's not like in the movies where it's shaking, you know, Mm -hmm. know, they shake the camera on liftoff. This rocket's very, very smooth. But on the way down, when you re-enter the atmosphere, then I would spill the whole cup all over myself because it was pretty violent. But the, right. certainly the liftoff was was surprisingly calm. And that was gonna that's leading me to my next question because it's one thing to get up and you know float around zero gravity and all that kind of stuff. But then coming back down, I would imagine that would be just as scary, really, as as launching. What was the experience of landing like? Well, that bit felt more like a roller coaster ride because it's very turbulent and um, the way they describe it is imagine throwing a, a large rock into a river. Um, it first actually hits the top of the water and stops and then it sinks down slowly to the mm-hmm. bottom. So mm-hmm. when we come back from space and hit the atmosphere, it's the same thing. So there's this rapid deceleration as we you know, smack the surface of the water, so to speak. And then we hit terminal velocity and then we fall down a bit more calm. But that first period of, there's about six and a half G, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly, something mm-hmm. like that, five mm-hmm. and a half, six and a half G in that range. Um, and, and just contextualize that for our listeners. So the liftoff part was more like if you're in a, in a sports car and mm-hmm. someone's hit the gas, particularly if you've got one of the new electric cars like a Tesla, where they have really fast, wicked acceleration. Mm-hmm. Imagine that, but for four minutes. Right. You know, you'd, and then you'd actually, you'd be at like 2,000, 3,000 kilometers an hour, by the way. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty fast. On the way down, it's it's significantly more than that. So um, it's, I, I, we don't have a lot of experiences in day-to-day life that feel like that. But if you look at the video of me coming down, you can see like my face, the skin is pulled back. My jaw is squished back on my throat. My skin is pulled back. My eyes are like peeled open like a cartoon character. Mm-hmm. That sounds very comfortable, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think someone someone on the crew uh, made a joke about getting free Botox treatment because their, <laughs> their skin was very tight afterwards. <laughs> uh, well, that would be a very expensive treatment, I would think. Um, now, but landing, actually landing, what was that process like? What did that feel like, like actually hitting the earth? So they have parachutes um, that come out and those take care of most of the, the fall. In fact, it's probably no worse than a hot air balloon coming down. Okay. They actually have these little, um, little very cool little air jet thrusters on the bottom. They, they call it an air cushion and then we just fall the last few centimetres down to the ground. So it's actually pretty comfortable. All right. All right. We, we, got, <laughs> we got less than a thousand feet. All right. Great. And I touchdown. And capsule touchdown, welcome back. The newest astronauts, Audrey Powers, William Shatner, our customers, Glenn DeVries and Chris Poshausen. What? And so when you got back to Earth, did they need to check your vitals and all that sort of stuff? Or was it just like, okay, please disembark and have a great day? <laughs> yeah, no, we went off and had a giant party. <laughs> Unlike a deep space mission where, you know, if you're going into space for a year, they would want to make sure that you're very, very healthy because if you have appendicitis while you're up there, they can't treat it. You'd be in serious trouble. So because you're up there for so long and it's so hard to come back on our trip because it was really a day trip, um, there's no, the, the, the threshold for being physically fit is actually pretty low. Um, and, you know, William Shatner at age 90 more than cleared the threshold for, for what they need for, for this type of journey because you're unlikely to have a major medical emergency um, in the same day. 
Now, you hinted at your career prior to becoming an astronaut. Tell me a bit about your career at NASA. Yeah, so I was quite lucky as an Australian to, to work at NASA as a, as a contractor. Unfortunately, I couldn't be a civil servant, but as, as a contractor, I still got to be involved in, in and lead some really cool projects. One of the sort of most exciting things I did was put a phone in space. Uh, we had a manager named Pete Klupa who used to joke that his phone was smarter than most satellites in orbit, which is probably true. There's something about ET that I want to mention. Yes, there. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, anyway, we, we, we did put a phone in space, but we didn't get any signal. <laughs> you um, didn't phone home. <laughs> no. Okay. But um, yeah, we we this we ended up putting one in orbit. So we we actually took a real phone and screen and all and 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 tossed three of them into orbit as free flying satellites and wrote an app to take pictures and send those pictures down to the ground. And so this was the, ironically, the cheapest and most powerful satellite launch to date. Um, it had, you know, because it was a modern, you know, smartphone, it had all the whiz-bang processor and memory, storage, camera, everything that's in your latest, you know, feature phone. Mm. Um, but it was, you know, $500 and it was in space. And so that was a kind of a breakthrough for for my team and I to, to really understand how to do accessible, low-cost space exploration. Satellites didn't have to cost billions of dollars if, if you could launch a really, really good one by simply tossing a phone into orbit. And and what would the, be the purpose of using that? Is that just to, to do essentially what those larger satellites do, but at a much lower cost? Yeah, so um, after f- f- sort of completing that project, we had this idea that, well, if satellites are so cheap, what if you could launch a lot of them? Mm. And I remember going to NASA headquarters in in Washington, D.C. and proposing to them that we could do some of their large multi-satellite constellation projects for um, cheap. You know, like we could chop a zero off the price tag. There was one mission I remember that they had slated for 10 years in the future if they ever got the money and it was going to be $350 million. I said, well, I think we could probably do that for $35 million. And they laughed us out of the room because the idea of putting a phone in orbit to do anything didn't seem credible to them. So mm. we decided to um, drink our own Kool-Aid, as they say at NASA, and mm-hmm. um, leave and start a company to do just that. And so we created a, a constellation of Earth imaging satellites that today map the whole world, every square inch of the world, every day. Wow. And what are those images used for? So there's so many uses. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of is we have a project that monitors every coral reef and every coastal estuary around the entire planet. Um, so if something changes, if there's an oil spill, we'll mm-hmm. see it the very next day. If there's a natural disaster like a flood or a landslide or an earthquake, we can actually see it. Um, and so this company is cool because most other satellites, it's kind of like with a high resolution camera, it's like looking at the world through a drinking straw. You can only see a tiny, small circle at any one time and you have to choose where you want to to look and take a picture. Um, But if you have so many satellites that you don't have to choose anymore, then you have every picture. And that makes this company, Planet Labs, the only one in the world that has photos of yesterday and today for everything that happened. Um, A great example is in um, just prior to the start of the invasion in Ukraine, which is a very terrible and unfortunate event that's happening. Um, the Russians had built a bridge across a river and some of the US government satellites had found this bridge and we're like, that's strange, there's a bridge here. Well, we actually had the same photo and we had yesterday morning's photo. So we could prove definitively they'd built that bridge in 24 hours. You grew up in Tumbarumba, which is a small town near the Snowy Mountains in New South Wales. Have you always been fascinated with space or was this something that kind of came to you later as you were sort of deciding what your career might be? No, I think I was born an alien and uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to, to find my way home. It just seems natural to me. I remember growing up with the, obviously, in you know, most of Australia, in fact, um, you know, we have beautiful skies. It's one of the wonderful things about places like Australia that are not fully developed yet is you have these beautiful night skies. And I just remember uh, always staring up at the the sky, seeing Halley's Comet when I was young uh, in 1986, uh, going and visiting the Parkes Radio Telescope with my sisters when I was much younger. Those are all sort of formative experiences, but I think I've just always loved space. And you said that going to space was very important. What is so important? And do you see it as becoming something that's very common? at the moment, it's really in the hands of the very, very wealthy. 
Yeah, I think like all new things that, you know, the elite class gets access to them first. And I'll be the first to acknowledge that, that that's the case. Um, but in the past, you had to be part of a government funded program. And in fact, you were probably part of either the American, Russian or European space program or more recently, the Chinese one. They're the only people, the only governments that were sending people to space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mostly billionaire funded and it does get a bad rep as, as being tourism. But I think that's just the beginning. And we're going to see, you know, thousands of people going up. I think if thousands or millions of people have seen the Earth from space, I think that will bring a new perspective to how we care for and steward our planet. And furthermore, I think going into space can help us with you know, moving industry off Earth, finding resources, solving the climate problem. There's so many things we can do in space, but we have to just take our first step. So what I did last year was just take one step. Chris Bosshausen, thank you for joining the program. Thanks, Whitney. While Australia hasn't always been at the forefront of the space race, it does have a vibrant and growing sector. To find out more, I spoke to Jacob Hacker, KPMG's Space Industry Account Lead. Jacob Hacker, welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me, Whitney. It's great to be here and talking about space this morning. So when I think of space and exploration, I don't necessarily think of Australia. So is the local space sector advanced? Yeah, great question, Whitney. And Australia, we're not necessarily at the scale of NASA where we're launching multiple missions each year, but we are really respected for a number of our capabilities in robotics and communications and digital twins and software. And all of these are really important when we're operating in space. And that's one of the reasons why Australia has partnered with uh, the US uh, as part of the Artemis missions and our Moon to Mars initiative locally. So you mentioned some of the areas that Australia is respected in. Can you just give me some more detail around the areas that we're focused on and also for development? Yeah, we uh, th there are a lot of parts to the space supply chain and I guess Australia increasingly has pieces that cover all of these and uh, we are quite heavily dominated by startup and scale-up companies uh, who are doing a range of things like manufacturing small satellites, developing launch and, and rocket technology, as well as launch facilities. Um, but there's also a whole lot of downstream. Once you've got the satellite in space, you actually need to use the data that's on that satellite. So ground infrastructure to receive those signals, as well as uh, the software to, I guess, analyze and, and, and make that useful. Uh, there are a number of sort of government strategy documents that guide that as well. Uh, Defense are shortly releasing a, a sovereign industry plan uh, which highlights some of their focus areas. I read recently that the Australian government invested $700 million in the civil space sector. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, it's an amazing number. And uh, it, it's really a, a significant amount to invest. Um, just two weeks ago, another $65 million was announced to support launch. So a number of spaceports as well as a future Australian astronaut. But uh, this money is to help improve local capability. It often goes to Australian companies and includes things like the Moon to Mars program, which will develop a, uh, a vehicle to go to the moon, as well as uh, the Space Infrastructure Fund. And then on top of that number you mentioned before, there's a, a whole lot of other spending from a, a defence and national security perspective, which totals almost $8 billion. So our ability to develop capability in Australia is really well positioned there. You mentioned that we partner with the US. What other countries are we partnering with in regard to uh, space projects? Definitely the US, uh, definitely the United Kingdom. We've got really strong partnerships with. Recently, there's been a what's called a space bridge set up with the UK, and that's to help facilitate trade and export and technology transfer, particularly at a, a small company scale. From a defence perspective, we're part of the Combined Space Operations Centre, which is a, a US-led initiative to collaborate from a military perspective in space. But from a civil perspective, we also uh, increasingly have relationships with India, Japan, South Korea, and I, I expect that we'll see additional collaboration going forward. I guess the other sort of good point to, uh, to make here is that a lot of our workforce is international. We do rely on international talent to help accelerate 
what we're doing here in Australia and uh, programs like the Global Talent Visa have been uh, very enabling here. So what do you expect the Australian space industry will look like, say, in, you know, 10, 20 years? Uh, You're asking me to get my crystal ball out. Mm -hmm. Um, I am. (laughs) Well... I might start with what the uh, the space agency's ambition is, and, and they're trying mm. to triple the sector in the next 10 years. So by 2030, we're looking at a workforce of in excess of 30,000 people and a, a GDP contribution of more than 12 billion Australian dollars, which is, is really significant. I'd love to see launch vehicles regularly launching from Australia. I think the inspirational need for our future workforce is somewhat intangible, but but also valuable if you can go on your school camp and see something launch into space. I expect that we'll be really key respected partners and contributing our fair share towards things like the Artemis missions uh, and hopefully more export capability as well. And if I was to take a really sort of ambitious stab, maybe closer to the 20 year mark, I think we'll have Australian capability on the lunar surface, um, whether that's an Australian vehicle or part of another mission, I think um, that's not too far away. Jacob Hacker, thank you for joining the program. Thanks for having me, Whitney. Gilmore Space Technologies is a venture-backed Australian rocket company developing new capabilities for launching small satellites into space and is now one of Australia's leading space companies. For more on what they do, I spoke to Adam Gilmore, CEO and co-founder. Adam Gilmore, welcome to the program. Thanks, Whitney. Nice to be with you. So, Adam, you were in banking and finance and you were there for quite a while. Why did you change direction in your career? I've always been interested in space and um, I was watching the market from the early 2000s and saw a massive opportunity for growth. And I kind of figured after 20 years of doing one thing, it was time for a change. And I thought, well, I want to do what I love. What I love looks like it's going to take off. So, you know, I'm going to have a go. Did you know anything about engineering or rocket science? Uh, Not initially, but I just learned over time. When I was a banker, I used to travel a lot, you know, 10, 12 hour flights, and I download a lot of NASA research papers or other university research papers on all kinds of things relating to rockets and just read them all on the plane. And so if I wanted to learn about ablative systems on rocket engines, I'd download five papers. And then by the time I landed, I knew all about ablative systems for rocket engines. And so you just systematically crunch through all the different bits of technology. And then years later, you know quite a bit. So you launched the company in 2015, and it's now one of the leading space companies in the country. What are the challenges you faced breaking new ground in the Australian sector? I think the main challenge was... You know, very different from a lot of the other um, more developed economy nations on Earth. Uh, Australia didn't have a space industry, didn't have a space agency. Defence Department really didn't do anything in space other than use everybody else's assets. So when we were starting, um, you know, there was just no real opportunity in Australia. So we always had to look outside of Australia for customer opportunity. But just trying to get anything done in the country was very difficult because people just didn't understand the tech, pretty much thought we were all crazy. Um, and, you know, like when you're setting up a rocket business, you need a place to test your rocket engines, you need a place to build the rockets, you need a place to launch them. Mm-hmm. And that was very, very challenging with a government across all levels of government that didn't really understand what was going on and didn't believe Australia could do it. How, how has that changed then in the last, say, couple of years? Oh, I mean, I think there's been a sea change, you know, rapidly even in the last 12 months. But I think the first positive move forward was, you know, the government set up a space agency and that gave the industry a bit of critical mass and some credibility. Mm. Hardly any money was put into the agency, but I was still happy because it just was like the stake in the ground Since then, the government hasn't put anywhere near enough money into the industry. But in the last 12 months, the Defence Department set up a space command and the government has said space is one of the six manufacturing priority areas. And so now we're seeing what I would consider correct amounts of money going into the industry, which is fantastic, but 
It's literally only this year. You're hoping for a successful rocket launch this year. What needs to happen to make that a a reality? Well, we have to uh, test probably 100 different major subsystems of our launch vehicle between now and September. We have to integrate them all into the rocket. We have to develop the launch site up at Abbott Point in far north Queensland. We have to get our launch approvals from the space agency for the launch site and for the first orbital launch. And we have to cross our fingers that nothing major goes wrong in our testing program. So do you think you're going to get there? Yeah, so we've done a lot already. So, I mean, the proviso that I like to put out there is in history, no initial rocket has ever successfully launched to space on the first attempt. Mm -hmm. And so we're running up against history in terms of what is the chance of the first one working. We are also building a second vehicle so that if the first one fails, we can try again pretty quickly. You have some pretty big plans for the future. What do you hope Gilmore Space Technologies achieves over the next five to 10 years? Well, we we have a mission statement called All Orbits, All Planets. So we're going to develop bigger and bigger launch vehicles that sooner rather than later take smaller payloads to the orbits of the Moon and to the orbits of Mars. And then in the longer run, by the end of the decade, we want a vehicle capable of taking people to space and to to set payloads on the surface of the moon and on the surface of Mars and to indeed explore moons and planets even beyond um, the orbit of Mars. That's kind of the fun in the town. On the money end of town, we want to be very successfully putting up all the constellations of small satellites that are being launched over the next decade and be a major market player in that business. We've spoken a lot about your work, but your Twitter bio gives us a bit more of an insight into your personal life. It reads, launch vehicle CEO, gymnast, and Star Wars fan. Any plans to do gymnastics and space? Combine the two. (laughs) I would love to. I mean, look, if I can get onto the surface of the moon and bring a gymnastics equipment down there and do tricks, that would be unreal. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure that would be unreal, and I'm sure there'd be a lot of people that'd want to see that. Admin Gilmore, thank you for joining the program. My pleasure. All right, well, that's all for the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the program. Until next time, thank you for listening to What Happens Next. You've been listening to What Happens Next with Whitney Fitzsimmons. Produced in association with KPMG Australia. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to the show through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Podcasts.